The views represented in this webinar are my own. They do not represent my institution or any other agency to which I'm affiliated with. We're gonna frame this case for a 62 year old and use it throughout so you can understand and see how things change when there is a surge. Back in November, a 62 year old presented with well-controlled hypertension, history of a knee replacement, was short of breath with a fever and tested positive for influenza A. The patient was admitted to the medical surge unit, two liters nasal cannula, and within hours, the nurse called a rapid response. The patient was intubated, transferred to the ICU, and developed severe ARDS. The patient's code status was full. In January, we saw our first case of COVID in the United States. However, it was the end of February before the first case came to me in Seattle. It's important to frame the surge capacity states or plans we have to manage an influx of patients during a disaster or pandemic setting like the one we're currently facing. I'm gonna take you through the first two states. Conventional is our typical state. We can handle a surge of up to 120% of ICU patients. The ethical framework supports individualized care through respect for patient autonomy, and we seek to maintain the standards of practice. In all states, we use strategies around our space, staff, and supplies. In conventional, we conserve and substitute, but our areas appear normal. We might call staff in to help, and we have the supplies we need either through conserving or substituting. Seven weeks ago today, our incident command opened in Seattle. The greater Seattle area's response to COVID shifted how we thought uh, about healthcare. As soon as we were realizing we were facing a surge, it became important to understand the ethical frameworks that were gonna guide our actions. During a public health crisis, this framework acts as an overlay to each profession's code of ethics. Dr. Wuschel will frame the nursing code of ethics soon. The ethical theory used during a disaster is an outcome-based framework with two primary goals. The first is to use strategies and avoid crisis. And second, if you're unable to avoid crisis, to transition to save the most number of lives as possible. The National Account Academy of Medicine added these principles to add a virtue-like approach to frame the actions to achieve the desired outcome. To the highest degree, standards must be fair to those affected by them. Decisions and information is to be shared transparently there is a duty to care for our community and our healthcare providers. There must be a consistent application to all people affected. Scarce resources are allocated to save the most number of lives as possible. And the actions must be in proportion to the degree of the scarcity. And we must be accountable for the just allocation of resources. On March 10th, our governor in Washington issued a stay at home order and schools were closed. We also canceled elective surgeries due to the shortage of PPE and we moved from conventional into contingency state. Contingency is when we can surge our ICU up to 200%. We continue to deliver care through the principle of respect for patient autonomy and we seek to preserve the standards of practice practice. We add the strategies of adapt and reuse. Our areas are repurposed like the many COVID floors going up across the nation. Our staff are extended and maybe reassigned. Our supplies like PPE are reused and adapted in ways we're not used to. 
Now I want to look at the same patient who presented at the end of February now. Patient still 62, has hypertension and a knee replacement history, arrives with influenza A, a fever and shortness of breath, decompensates after admission to the medical surgery floor, and is intubated and goes to the ICU. Now the mortality rate for severe ARDS is 46%. So when this patient arrived to the ICU in early March, the clinicians had a discussion with the patient's loved ones and recommended to limit CPR because it was not medically appropriate to provide and continued all other medically appropriate treatments. But this is a change from what we saw in November. With the pandemic of COVID, we are bearing witness to extraordinary changes. And I'm going to review three bedside nursing issues that have come up in Washington while in contingency state, followed with some strategies some institutions in my area have tried. While scene safety has not changed, COVID has sharpened its focus. I wanna take you back to one of the first things you learned in lay responder first aid. You swept your head from side to side and asked, is the scene safe? You might have tied scene safety to outside examples like a burning building, rushing traffic, or even a dangling electrical wire. In healthcare, we still look for scene safety, but instead of looking for a burning building, we're trying to create a safe way to enter. Much like the firefighter who puts on equipment before going into the burning building, our burning building is the illness our patients are facing. Now with COVID, we've been forced to navigate this novel virus in a different way than we would like. Typically we err on the side of caution and move up a level whenever there is uncertainty. But because of the critical shortage of N95s, we are forced to lean into the science we do know to guide the safest approach possible. What we do know about the coronavirus is that for high risk procedures like intubation and high flow nasal cannula, airborne precautions are required. We know that we need to use standard precautions everywhere to limit fomite exposures. And the current evidence supports similarities to many respiratory illnesses like influenza that require respiratory droplet precautions for all close interactions. Our scene is safe when we have put the right personal protective equipment on for the situation we are going into. And it's important that the standards of changing PPE in between patients aims to protect them from one another. And given the scarcity of PPE, the extended use and reuse directly aims to protect the healthcare staff. This means if a patient with COVID needs a merchant assistant, we do not rush in. We must take the time to assess what equipment is needed and to put it on correctly. From an ethics perspective, there is a duty to care for healthcare staff and to protect them Ensuring this protection means they maintain their ability to care for our community in need. Now, some might be thinking about how this may feel, standing outside of the room, taking time to don a papper when a patient is coding. And this came up recently for an admitted patient on the med surge floor with COVID. And when the nurse, physician, and ethics spoke, we went in to talk to the patient and we said something along the lines of, we are working hard to provide the very best care we can. And due to the coronavirus infection, we need to put on extra gear to be safe. We do not think this will affect anything. However, in the rare case of an emergency, it may result in a delayed response and a worse outcome. We hope that this doesn't happen and we wanna make sure that you understand. Do you have any questions? This is something that many hospitals in my area 
are explaining to patients upon admission. Sharing our limits and the reasons behind them promotes fairness and provides transparency. Visitor restrictions also began in contingency state. Visitor restrictions were framed by the state and hospital's duty to care and steward the scarce nature of PPE. They also aim to protect vulnerable patients and staff from exposures from the deadly virus and conserve the PPE for the frontline staff. The state order sought to provide a consistent and fair approach to all people in Washington. And while the recommendations to limit visitors aims to protect them, it can feel morally wrong not to welcome a loved one to the bedside. This is especially true when a patient is imminently dying. Many nurses expressed a distress, not being able to support a good death for their patient. This is not easy, yet there are some practical approaches that may help. Some institutions have cloth masks donated from the community for visitors to use. Some created methods to use technology to take the place of in-person conversations. And some are providing recommendations to limit visitation and allowing the loved ones to take the informed risk of being at the bedside. At another institution, the nurses taped on the floor to mark a six feet parameter from the patient's head and then marked positions for chair placement, literally making the space for physical distancing at the bedside. They encouraged less than 15 minutes inside the hot zone to minimize infectious exposure and tried to have droplet precautions available for all that entered. I encourage you to speak to your leaders and understand what options may be available at your hospital. In contingency, we have heard a lot about ventilators and equipment. However, these machines should not be the focus of our scarce resource journey. You, our nurses, our most precious and scarce resource your skills, knowledge, and clinical intuition are like no other profession. In a pandemic like the one we're facing, many have been asked to report to an unfamiliar area and help with patients receive ICU level care and hospital treatments. While reassignment during a disaster fits under the duty to steward our most scarce resource, nurses, and if we reach crisis, reassignment will be proportionate to the emergent need, not more, not less. Reporting to an in unfamiliar place can be implemented in a fair and accountable way. Some strategies include doing an orientation to a new area before the surge occurs and having shadow assignments Others are pulling RNs to be in support roles who are experts, like a critical care nurse acting as a preceptor for others who are providing direct patient care. And there are also free available resources for non-ICU clinicians to learn how to care for the COVID ICU patient, available online through the American Association of Critical Care Nurses and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. While the level of support may feel different in emergency, everyone should still have access to support. I encourage you to discuss your surge plan and reassignment plan with the leaders at your institution to understand what level of support is available to you in addition to the ones available online. 